Hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live, your home for navigating the road to passing the ARE. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and in today's episode, Mike Newman is going to share his tips on how to get started passing the ARE. Mike is going to give you tips on how to get started. Um, he'll do an overview of the different types of exams and what they cover. And my favorite tip is about the fastest way to take all the exams. Now we'll make sure to post the PDF that Mike discusses uh, in the show notes so you can download it and follow along. Uh, but before we get started, if you'd like to attend our next ARE Live broadcast, visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. Uh, during the live broadcast, you'll have a chance to ask questions and share your answers with Mike. And if you don't know Mike, uh, he's an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also the founder of Shed Studio, and he's the instructor for Black Spectacles online AIA ARE prep curriculum. Uh, if you haven't already checked out our AIA ARE prep curriculum, head over to blackspectacles.com where you can watch any of the free tutorials from the courses. Uh, and today, we have a very special Black Spectacles promo code to share, so make sure you stick around until the end of today's episode. But first, let's hand it over to Mike. So, uh, as uh, Mark just said, uh, this is going to be the top 10 tips. We're just going to dive right in. Our first tip, first tip of the day, uh, is don't panic. Uh, this sounds like I'm joking. I'm not joking. I mean, don't panic. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, it's very easy to get into a situation where you uh, go out, you take the exam, and something goes wrong. You get a bunch of questions you didn't know. Uh, and now you're like, oh my God! Now I got to, I have to, I have to outsmart the exam. It's the worst possible thing. Everything is calm. It doesn't matter if you fail one of the exams. You know, maybe costs a little bit of money, takes a little time. It really doesn't matter. This is one of those things uh, that you just have to like be loose about it. Architects hate being loose about these kinds of things. Uh, you just have to get over that. Um, there's a million possible questions that you could be asked. Any number of things on any one of these topics. Uh, a huge array of possibilities. There's no way you could possibly know all of the answers. It's quite plausible that you could get a situation where you get an exam that is filled with questions you just don't know. Say la vie. Don't worry about it. Don't panic. It's also quite possible you could really not know that much at all. Take the exam and by happenstance get a whole bunch of questions that you do know and pass easily. This is one of those things, don't overthink it. It's not a big deal. You take the exam as many times as you need to take it and just get it passed. This is how it goes. This is one of those things. If you happen to pass them all in the first shot, have, a, have an extra uh, you know, a beer that night. It's all good. But uh, don't fret about it if, uh, if, it, uh, if something doesn't go quite the way you thought. Uh, one of the biggest problems, I've been teaching classes on this for quite a while now, and one of the biggest problems I see is that people who have had, say, maybe for one reason or another, have maybe failed a, a particular exam, say, three times, and they start getting overly panicked about it. They start overthinking the questions. They start trying to, well, maybe they mean this, or maybe they mean that by this question. As soon as you start overthinking it, you're going you're gonna to keep, it becomes a, a, a cycle, right? Don't worry about it. It's all okay. If you pass, awesome. If you don't, just take it again. No big deal. Uh, I know that sounds sort of obvious, but uh, trust me, you'll know what I mean once you start actually taking, taking the exams. It can feel like a big weight. Don't let it be. Tip number two, find your resources. So, okay, uh, what do I mean by find your resources? Uh, first of all, as everybody knows, there's lots and lots of guidebooks out there. Uh, there's flashcards. There's a whole bunch of different uh, guidebooks that are available. Uh, they're all pretty great. They have very different uh, qualities to them. Uh, some are more generalized. Some are more specific. Uh, different people will like different ones. Find the ones that you like. Uh, everybody you know is going through or has gone through or will be about to go through this. Uh, because you're all architects, I assume all the only people you know are architects. Right? Isn't that the case? Because right? that's, that's how I was, at least. Um, so uh, you have people who have these resources. So before you go out and buy $500 worth of materials or something, test them out. See what you think. Try something uh, that, you know, find one example, read it, uh, see if it's a style that you like, uh, and use that to your advantage. Um, so definitely uh, track down the materials that you think work for you. There's also lots of online uh, sources. 
Uh, as Mark mentioned at the beginning, uh, Black Spectacles, there are other sources as well. There's some uh, structures ones. There's a few other uh, elements out there that are, that are worth uh, sort of tracking down. Uh, a key resource that you have also is all the local AIA offices. Uh, we're here right now in Chicago at the AIA Chicago. They have classes, uh, some of which I run, some of which other people run. Uh, they have uh, the uh, Young uh, Architects Forum. We have the Emerging Professionals. Um, there's a whole series of different uh, resources that you can track down at the local AIA office. I highly recommend that you spend some time uh, going in and just finding out what resources you have available to you, especially before you start buying a lot of other materials. Uh, I've been into many of the AIA offices. I know the BSA has an amazing one in Boston, uh, a lot of resources available. Uh, the New York one, the San Francisco one, uh, so every one that I've been in has lots of resources and they're happy to have you there to go talk to them and find out what's going on. Uh, that's a huge part for their mission. They really want to be helpful. So use that as uh, part of your uh, resources. Um, the other thing, a lot of you probably don't, haven't even asked anybody in your firm yet. Um, there's two reasons why you should ask somebody in your firm. It's a little different these days uh, post-recession, but uh, back in the good old days, uh, a lot of the firms would actually pay for your uh, your ARE, uh, so because uh, it's actually advantageous to the firm to have more licensed architects, and so they would, in order to encourage you, they would actually pay for it. Fewer firms are doing that right now, but there's still a few out there. Definitely worth asking. But there's also a lot of resources in a lot of those firms. Uh, you know, if they if they don't know that you're uh, active actively out looking to uh, to go. Uh, do uh, to take the exam, they're not going to know to say, hey, by the way, we have some four-year-old uh, guidebooks over here, or we have uh, you know, uh, videos from when somebody else took it uh, 10 years ago or something. All of that is going to be useful. Things change. Older information is going to be a little bit old, but the core of the, of the exam is still going to be essentially the same as anything you'd find in a guidebook from 1990, right, 1985. Like, it's still going to be essentially the same. There'll be a lot of new information about sustainability and things like that on the later ones, but you can get a lot of good information from really anything that anybody has in your firm. Definitely track down the easy stuff first. Go through that uh, so you have your access uh, to, to something to start, start your process off. Um, you're definitely going to be using multiple sources for your resources. You're going to want books. You're going to want to be online. You're going to want to be uh, doing uh, 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 group efforts. There's a lot of different things. You want to you know, try them all. Um, the other thing to say is, just because your firm doesn't necessarily have it, you know somebody whose firm has access to this stuff, just make a deal with them. Just go, work out a deal, go into their firm at, at lunch or in the evening or something like that, and just make sure that uh, you uh, have access to it. And then there's a couple of these uh, sort of general uh, books that I want to mention. They're sort of specific topic issues uh, that are worth uh, being uh, kind of a little focused on for a second. One of them is all the Qing books. Um, the uh, Qing is a little bit less um, uh, ubiquitous as it used to be uh, back uh, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, every architecture student uh, had uh, at least one or two copies of Qing somewhere uh, in their uh, portfolio of books. Um, now probably it's not quite as, uh, as well known, but they're incredibly useful books. They have very uh, useful uh, imagery and sort of written elements that uh, kind of tell a, a very complicated story in very easy to understand ways. Uh, it's a really good sort of starting point to kind of put it all into uh, a certain kind of terminology that you can then use uh, to build on. Another book that's uh, completely worth uh, finding a copy of is The Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice. Uh, the Handbook of Professional Practice, the, the Construction Documents and Services exam uh, is I don't know what percentage, but I'm just going to make up a number. Let's say it's 40% straight out of that book. Uh, I just made that number up, right? So don't, don't write that down or anything. But uh, a huge percentage of the CDNS uh, exam really comes straight out of that book. It's about the contracts. It's about uh, the relationships, uh, the, how you kind of run a firm, all of those kinds of things. That shows up exactly in there. There's lots of great information, totally worth getting. Uh, I can almost guarantee that somewhere in an office you're working in, that book exists someplace. Uh, so you can find it. Totally worth buying. It's, great. it's a great thing to have in your, in your uh, library. Uh, but you can also check it out uh, and, and look at it before you even uh, buy one or just see what you've got. 
And then there's a couple of other examples. The graphic standards is sort of a you know the the old uh, old time. Um, I, I was gonna I was trying to find the my I have one from 1936 that I can't find, which has these amazing details of uh, 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 masonry details, and uh, which I just love. This one's from I think the 70s or 80s or something. Um, uh, so I actually have like three or four of them. Uh, they're great books. They're really useful. You will never stop at, start at the beginning and read through the book. That's not what it's meant for. It's meant as a thing that you uh, kind of flip through, find some information, uh, understand some particular piece. It's more of a reference book. Uh, it's useful in this process as, as, uh, as a reference. Um, and then the, the next one that I want to use as a very particular uh, uh, example is the MEEB book, the Mechanical and Electrical Equipment for Buildings. Um, this book uh, is tremendously useful for the systems exam. Uh, essentially, if you didn't do anything else and you just got this book and flipped through it for uh, you know, some number of hours, uh, you, would, uh, you would be able to pass that exam. Uh, it's incredibly useful, it's right on point, and it is perhaps the most boring book you've ever uh, read. Um, so you will find, if you start from the beginning and just start reading through, let's say you start on page 20 and you read through to page 25, you're going to realize you don't remember anything you just read. Uh, so don't do that. Um, that's not how it's going to work for you, most likely. If you're somebody who can do that, great, but most of us, that's not going to work. My suggestion, the way to do it, go through, flip through, look at the pictures, read the captions, and when you read the captions, uh, if you sort of understand what's going on and it kind of gives you a full flavor, you, as you start going through, you'll get a very wide sense of all the different things that are potentially on the exam. And as you read something, you read a caption, look at the picture, if it makes sense to you, keep moving on. If it doesn't make sense to you, you read that portion of the book, that little chapter. And then what that does is it gives you an opportunity to be reading for a purpose. You're not just reading a topic, you're reading to figure out why you didn't understand the, that caption in that photo. So you're looking for specific information at that point. You're going to be much more likely to get very good information in. Uh, so you're looking at, uh, the, at the imagery, at the diagrams, at the photos, and then going through and focusing on uh, the captions. Um, and there's a, a number of different sort of examples that you can uh, sort of check out. Here's, here's one little example um, uh, that uh, is just, when you look at this image, you'll start to see, uh, okay, this is about an atrium and smoke and uh, how the uh, smoke, where the smoke detector is. Uh, you know, so I start looking, all right, so I have an atrium. If I had a fire down here, uh, heat and smoke is going to go up. Where does it get out? Well, it gets out through that system there. There's a smoke detector there. Uh, I've got uh, um, sprinklers in sort of logical locations that uh, are spread out over, uh, you know, in, in sort of logical ways. If you look through something like this and you're like, okay, I get it, well, then move on. Don't spend any more time on it. Tip number three, be strategic. All right, that's sort of obvious. But let's think about what we mean by be strategic. One thing is, and I, I say this to a lot of people, and it always cracks me up because I can always tell that nobody will ever do it. Uh, one thing is, you can take the exam to learn the exam. Like, so what does that mean? It means, what's the best way to learn how the exam works? Well, just go take it, right? Let's say you studied for three days and went and took them all. You know, just take take a couple days off, go take them all. Well, what if you passed? three or four of them. Wouldn't that be awesome? Think about that. You would then only have to focus your studies on the ones you didn't pass. So you spent a few days and a few hundred bucks uh, to take away half of the process. Totally doable. If I was saying this to a bunch of MBAs, those MBAs would say, wait, wait, you're telling me that nobody will ever see my score, that I don't have to tell anybody that I've taken it or not taken it or anything. Uh, the, I would learn a huge amount from taking it. Well, I'll just go tomorrow and do it. Almost no architects will do it because architects don't want to walk into something they know they might fail. It's the weirdest thing. Like, it doesn't matter. You could totally do it. I mean, I know it costs money. It's a, I, there are issues. But you could totally do this, right? Uh, and you would learn a huge amount. So that's one of the options. Don't fret about it. Like, some people get into these things where they sign up for the exam and then they, like, put it off again. Oh, I have that 
that wedding coming up, and they, so they put it off. Oh, we have that big project, and so they put it off again. Like, you will never not have a wedding coming up. You will never not have a big project. You will never be less busy. I know that sounds amazing to you because you probably feel like you're pretty damn busy. You will never be less busy. It doesn't happen, right? Just take it. You'll learn a huge amount just from that process. Another thing about uh, being strategic, treat it as a social event. Uh, this is one of the things I love about this exercise. Uh, the fact that you know we're going to go through these top ten tips and then we're going to uh, head downstairs for the folks that are here uh, um, uh, in in Chicago. Uh, that's a great resource. Uh, if you have friends who are going through the same process, maybe somebody buys one set of books and you buy another set of books, and then you can share them back and forth, right? Suddenly you've got people who you can meet with, and you say, "All right, we're going to meet on Saturday for three hours." That means you have to actually have gone through it and force yourself into that process. It forces you to keep on a pace, right? Treat it as a social experience. Uh, know the NCARB system and where you are within that process. So understand how the rolling clocks work, all of that kind of thing. I'm not going to really get into it because it's different in different states and we have people in different places, but you should understand the rolling clocks. Um, often there is more than one rolling clock, like for the folks in Illinois, there's actually two rolling clocks. You have a three-year and a five-year. It's kind of complicated. Um, know where you are in that whole process. And then the other thing is you should know that there's a transition about to go on, which is uh, the um, ARE is going to be going from the ARE 4 uh, series to the ARE 5 series. So we're moving over to the ARE 5.0. So the current exam in 4.0, uh, or 4.1 or whatever it is now, uh, is construction documents and services. Um, Programming, planning, and practice. So it's uh, there's the CDNS, and then there's programming, planning, and practice (PPP). There's site planning, uh, building design, and construction systems, which is what people used to refer to as means and methods. Uh, there's structural systems. There's building systems, and then there's schematic design, which is the only current one that is all vignette. Uh, essentially, all the other ones have vignettes within them. They have multiple choice and vignettes, drawing vignettes. Uh, the schematic design is all vignette. And what the 5.0 is going to move to, so that's seven exams. The 5.0 is going to go to uh, six exams, practice management, uh, which is obviously about um, how your firm works, uh, how you set up the insurance, all of those kinds of things. Project management, which is like project delivery. Is it uh, design build? Is it uh, design bid build? Uh, what kind of contracts are being used? Uh, how do the change orders work? Uh, programming and analysis would be all that sort of uh, stuff that you need to know uh, prior to uh, really starting um, uh, starting a, 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 an exam a, 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 an architectural project. So, uh, what's the site like? What's the soil like? What's the uh, topography like? What's the context like? Uh, is the feasibility logical? Uh, is the program match the goals? All of those kinds of things would show up in that one. Uh, project planning and design uh, becomes, this is where you start looking at actual design work and uh, the, 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 uh, like things like exiting and sort of general planning issues about how the, the design actually is going to move forward. Uh, and then the fifth one there is um, uh, uh, project development and documentation. So that one is uh, not about the design, but about communicating that design. Right, so it's the drawing set, it's the specifications, it's uh, all of that kind of stuff. And then this last one, which is kind of the most intriguing one to me, uh, is construction and evaluation. Um, this is the one uh, for 5.0 that feels the most um, unknown to me uh, because there hasn't been in the past a lot of evaluation uh, questions. There's always been some evaluation questions on there, but not a whole exam worth. So it's kind of an interesting question. I have a feeling it's more about CA, construction administration, than it is about evaluation, but um, it will be interesting to see as they start to give us more information what, what's really going to go into that exam. So you have a situation where we're going from uh, seven exams that have uh, questions um, that you have to answer and also vignettes into six exams that no longer are going to have vignettes. So the drawing program is going to go away in 5.0. Uh, it will be replaced with ideas uh, like case studies and things like that. So the case studies are going to be where there'll be a bunch of different pieces of information. Uh, you might have a snippet of uh, code, a snippet of 
a spec and maybe a drawing, and then there might be four or five different questions about that grouping of information. So you have to kind of piece things together in sort of a multifaceted way. Um, one thing is clear to everybody, and anybody who's heard me talk about this stuff before knows, uh, has heard this uh, before, um, the vignette program is kind of ridiculous. It's, a, it's, a cra it's like you're drawing in PowerPoint, right? I mean, it's a, it's a ridiculous uh, uh, program. Now, it kind of has to be a ridiculous program because, first of all, it was designed in 94. Like, you know, we were using 486s, I think, in 94, right? This is, uh, this is a very different computer age uh, than it was then. Um, and uh, the sort of, if you, if you use, say, AutoCAD or, or Revit or anything like that, well, then the people who don't use that particular program would be at a disadvantage. So they thought about kind of redoing a new program where, they could, where you could do drawing, and it's just too expensive. It just didn't make any sense. And they realized it's better to actually just show images and then have you review the Im information in them and kind of work it through that way. So there's going to be a lot of different ways that you can kind of manipulate information, uh, but it was not going to be the drawings anymore. So here's a key thing about being strategic. Uh, I have no idea if the case study process, especially the, for the first year of that, and all the other changes that are being made are going to be easier or harder. I have no idea. I do know already that the vignette programs are ridiculous, but I also know how to study for them, right? You can figure that out. There's lots of information around. In many ways, the devil you know may be better than the devil you don't know. 5.0 is not going to come into play for well over a year, uh, and then there'll be a year and a half, I believe, 18-month um, period where both will be offered. So you have actually plenty of time to just do it in 4.0. But be strategic. Figure out which one you want to do. Figure out what fits in your time scale, and then do that. Know that this is coming because it can start to get a little complicated. And speaking of being strategic, uh, one thing is worth noting, um, which actually comes off of the straight off of the NCARB site. Um, if you were super clever uh, and were trying to be as efficient as possible, you could actually do uh, one, two, and three here, construction documents and services, programming, planning, and practice, and site planning and design. If you passed all those in 4.0, you, if you note uh, that, right, those all fit there. Uh, the only pieces of information that you hadn't covered are now in two other ones. So you could conceptually only take five exams. <laughs> How about that? Right? Now, I'm intrigued by this, uh, these two exams because uh, here in the 4.0 we have structural systems and we have building systems and we have schematic design and we have uh, building design. Lots of, uh, of those topics have a lot of information, like everything about all the HVAC systems and concrete and wood and all that stuff and structures and all the structural things. Those are all going into these two exams. So I have no idea what those exams are going to be like. But if your idea of efficiency is doing fewer exams, there you go. Be strategic. But my suggestion, just do it. Just start signing up, figure out a timeline that makes sense for your, your ability to study, and just make it happen. OK, tip number four. Now we're kind of getting into some of the specific stuff. You should understand the contracts. Um, you don't have to understand every aspect of the contracts, but there's a few elements that you should understand about the contracts, uh, the AIA contracts. Now, uh, what this means is you're going to have to actually read the contracts. Um, reading contracts is almost as boring as reading the MEEB book. Uh, it's not quite as boring as that, but it's pretty close. Um, it's very, very difficult to just sit down and read through these contracts. So once again, one of the things that I'm going to suggest uh, is that you actually spend some time understanding the basics of what it is you're looking for so you then when you read the contracts you're looking for how does this contract actually say that. So I'll give you a couple little quick uh, examples of that. Uh, if you think about uh, kind of first of all who has contracts here. So um, the, uh, the obvious one that you most care about right is the uh, owner uh, to architect. So we have the owner-architect contract, which is the uh, B101, or one of its related uh, ones, B107, or something like that. Uh, we also have the owner-contractor, which is the A101, or the A107, et cetera, et cetera. 
right? Those are the two main contracts. There's then the A201. So the A101, uh, the owner and the contractor sign. The B101, the owner and the architect sign. Who signs the A201 general conditions? Anybody know? One of the key contracts that rules all of the work that you do. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, it is not the architect contractor. There is no contract between the architect and the contractor. And yet, we have lots of relationships between ourselves, between the architect and the contractor. How does that work? The two contracts are referenced into each other's contract. contract. So the A201, the general conditions, is not signed. It's referenced into the other contracts. So if you actually had a contract that had all of the information in it about, like, Who's paying for the Porter Johns? Who's paying for the electricity? Where does the, uh, you know, how do the change orders work? All of, if you had all of that actually in your contract, the contract itself would be incredibly long and very hard for people to understand what they were signing. So what they do is they have a whole bunch of standard information that can be altered per situation, but it has a bunch of standard information that's put off to the side. So all that standard stuff, the general conditions, Everybody can understand because it's off to the side. And the other ones then say, and by the way, we include the A201 in this contract. So they reference it in to that contract. So you focus the contracts on the important things that need to be understood for the negotiation, but then all that backdrop of information that has to be there for everybody to know what their roles are is all still there. right? Uh, so understanding who has a contract. Uh, if I have a subcontractor uh, um, and that subcontractor has a contract uh, with uh, the contractor, obviously, um, can I talk to the subcontractor? Can I go talk to them? The answer is no, I cannot. Now, we all know that we go talk to subcontractors contractors all the time. Whatever. We're not talking about how things work in the world. We're talking about how they work on the exam. right? You cannot talk to the, that subcontractor. Who do you talk to? The general contractor, right? Technically, you actually talk to the owner who talks to the general contractor. But because the A201 says, oh, by the way, there's this relationship between you guys, you can actually talk straight because you're acting as an agent for the, uh, for the owner. So you can talk straight uh, to the general contractor, right? So that conversation has to go through the general contractor before it goes to anybody else. So when you start looking at the exam, you're, uh, I mean, at the, at the contracts, you're looking for these uh, key pieces of information. One of them is, Architects do design intent. Contractors do means and methods. So your role is to do, this is what we think it should be. This is how we think it fits into the world. Code, all of that kind of stuff. The contractor's job is to then make that happen. Those are two very different contracts. Just think about the different way that we said that. right? The contractor's job is to make that happen. It's not to be like, this would be a good idea. It's to make it happen. Different kinds of contracts, they sound different. There's different words. They have different meaning. And they have dramatic impact on who does what at the site. Uh, I have to say, this is one of those things where, since I've been teaching uh, this stuff, I have been kind of amazed at how little anybody tells any of their employees about how the contracts work. You guys are probably standing on sites out there saying all kinds of things that you should not be saying. Right? This is one of the great things about studying for the ARE. Taking the ARE, we all know, kind of sucks. right? But studying for the ARE, you're absolutely going to be a better architect because of it. There's no question. Uh, so architects design intent, contractors means and methods. So let's look at a couple of uh, what that might mean. Uh, you look at the standard of care. This is the, the official way that we talk about how these things go. Uh, the standard of care for an architect is uh, uh, reasonable and prudent. The standard of care for the contractor is conformance. Right? Those are very different. You have to start looking for those terminology, that, that, that terminology in order to start reading the, the contracts. You'll start seeing it differently, and it'll make sense. Don't just start reading. Understand what you're looking for first. By contract, you can only uh, promise uh, competency. You cannot promise beauty. There is no part of the contract that says, I'm going to give you the most beautiful building ever. It can't. It doesn't make any sense. How could you do that in a contract? 
right? Contracts are not about that. Code is not about that. The exam is not about that. Don't get confused by it. Do not think that your world in this part of the discussion is about anything like beauty or interest. Tip five, you already know structures. Trust me, you already know structures. The thing you don't may have some trouble with is speaking your version of structures uh, into a world of engineer speak, right? That's all it is. It's not as complicated as it looks or seems. Uh, so let's give a, a couple little general statements about this, and then I'll use an example. Uh, so one is concepts are more important than formulas. The formulas, the entire point of the formulas uh, is to make tangible the concepts. Often, if you understand the, for, the, the formula well enough, you understand the concept uh, and what, how the, the concept and the formula fit together, you don't need to do any math. It's not about doing math. There will be more questions about sort of general ideas than there will be about math. Uh, every once in a while, you'll have to do some math just so they can see that you know how to plug numbers in. Um, nobody's going to expect you to memorize formulas, although it's actually useful to memorize a few of them just so you can recognize them quickly. All that information will actually be given to you. You just have to be able to find the right information and uh, plug it in in the right spot. It's kind of a key sort of thing to understand. Engineers will say things that sound like they are truths, but they're not truths. They're just simplifications. The world is complex. They look for ways to make it simple so that you know big complex things, decisions can get made. Uh, don't get fooled by that. You actually do understand what's going on, even if they say it in some odd way. They're still saying something that you already understand. Uh, and obviously, don't fret, because uh, it's not going to help. So let me do an example here. I'm going to use a couple of uh, uh, terms. One is the modulus of elasticity, E. Uh, one is the moment of inertia, I. Uh, and the section modulus, just as another example, of, um, is uh, uh, S. Um, and here's some examples off to the side here of uh, uh, the section modulus being calculated. So the E, modul modulus of elasticity, is a term about the stress-strain diagram uh, that describes essentially how robust a material is. The modulus, uh, modulus of elasticity for steel is significantly higher than it is for, say, wood. Wood has a pretty good modulus. You know, wood's pretty strong. It's pretty good. Steel's way stronger. It's going to have a much higher modulus of elasticity. The I and the S are about shape. So the E is about material. The I and the S are about shape. Right? So uh, if I'm thinking about a beam that I want to have span across, uh, say, 20 feet, let's say I'm putting a joist in, and have this beam, uh, this joist go across about 20 feet, do I want uh, to be tall and thin, or do I want it to be flat and wide? What do you think? Anybody? Tall and thin, obviously, right? Right? That's what a joist looks like in section, badly. Uh, why is that? Because shape matters, right? What I want is I want for, for spanning capacity, similar in, in columns, it's a little more complicated because it's directional and multi-direction. Multi in beams, it's sort of straightforward to understand, so I'm going to talk about beams. Uh, if I have a beam spanning across, what do I want? I want to get the meat of the material as far apart from the central axis as I can. Right? That's what's going to be the most useful. Well, how do I know that? How, do I, how do, can I tell one from the other when I look around? Well, the I and the S are about shape. So is a bunch of other stuff. There's a bunch of different ones that are these little quick formulas to get at the idea of shape. So if I have a higher I, the moment of inertia, that's going to mean that I have more material farther away from the central axis. doesn't mean it's strong material. Like I have balsa wood that has a very high uh, moment of inertia. doesn't mean it's going to be strong, right? Because I also have the, the wood itself has to be strong. But I need the shape to be the strong shape as well, right? So I have these different ways of looking at these, these, these elements. The reason I show all this section modulus, the S, and how you get to it, the reason that those things exist is not to make life hard and confusing and weird. The reason is because if you're actually going to do the whole out calculation and figure out where the different chunks of the material are, you're going to do a whole big calculation of it out, you realize that a bunch of the time you keep stumbling across the same 
uh, groupings of, uh, of pieces of information. So why not just call them S and make a list of them? You can look it up in a book. Instead of finding all it, you just look it up, and there it is. Right? It's just a way to simplify the world. Nothing complicated. E is about material. I and S about shape. Here's one crazy look and formula. Right? Triangle means delta, change. So that's talking about deflection. 5WL to the fourth over 384EI. Like it's completely nutty looking. Right? How can you know what the hell that's supposed to mean? You know what it means. If I have that joist that we just talked about, and I'm spanning across, and I put a weight on it, and the weight is W, right? The dead weight plus the live load, right? I have a W of the weight on it. It's going to deflect down, right? It's going to bend down. It's going to start having that sort of, uh, you know, shape of little curved shape. Of course it is. You know that. Well, how much is it going to go down? What would be the change? How much would that happen? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out here, right? That's the delta. That's the change, right? So this is a formula to understand that. Now, why am I using this formula? I, we could talk about any number of different formulas. This one, I think, just happens to look crazy, and I love that you can actually figure it out so fast and easy if you just stop and think about it. Uh, so we look at it. The 5 and the 384 are just constants. Who cares about them? They're there. Whatever, right? doesn't matter. You don't need to worry about those. The W, that's the weight. The L, that's the length of that beam. The E and the I, we just talked about. That's the modulus of elasticity and the moment of inertia. So let's say we have this joist, and I'm trying to decide between doing it out of uh, wood or steel. Right? I mean, unlikely situation. But let's say that's what we're, we're trying to decide. We're going to make this joist out of wood or steel. Right? Everything else is the same. We have a set situation. We have a certain length. We have a certain load, that, you know, design expectation load that we're expecting. So there's a certain idea, this design concept that we're thinking about. And now the question is, do we put uh, a wood beam there or a steel beam? Well, what's the E going to have? What's going to happen to the E if we use steel instead of wood? It's going to go way up, right? Steel is much more robust from a modulus elasticity standpoint than the wood is. Even Douglas fir, which is a very good wood, right, is going to have a much lower uh, E than the steel would be. So, okay, you look at that formula. What does that tell us? That tells us that the denominator, the lower number, is going to get much bigger. Therefore, the overall fraction will be a smaller number. Therefore, if we use steel, it's telling us that we're going to have less deflection uh, because it's steel than if it was wood. That was something you knew already. That's something, now that you look at that diagram, that, that formula, you can tell that's what it's saying to you. right? It's complicated looking, but it's nothing you didn't know. You're going to use steel versus wood. The steel is going to be less, have less deflection. You know that. There it is, right there. The E goes up. The overall number goes down, less deflection. Use wood instead. That lower denominator goes up. The, the delta changes. Therefore, that means there's more deflection. This is what you know. OK, let's say it's wood. Let's say we chose uh, Douglas fir, and we're doing it out of wood. And we just like we talked about a minute ago, we say, all right, are we going to do it uh, vertically, or are we going to do it uh, like a board? Right? So we have two choices. One is that we're going to use uh, vertically and in section, and the other one is that we're going to use it like a board in section. Well, that's about shape, right? The farther away, we said that I want to span across, I want to get the meat of the material farther away from the central axis of uh, whatever it is my spanning material is, right? Uh, so there's the central axis for that one. Sorry, I didn't line them up very well. Sorry about that. Right? On the one that's a board, the material isn't far away from the central axis. I'm not getting any benefit from it. You know this already, right? You put a board out, you make it nice and wide to walk across, that'd be great, right? But now it bends way down. Be nice and stiff if you stand it upright, but now it's going to be hard to walk on, right? Because it's thin, so you have to put a floor on it. Uh, so, like, this is stuff that you know, right? That I, I'm going to have a bigger number for I in the one situation. Uh, that gives me gives me that uh, that one standing tall than I am going to have it on the one that's laying flat. Exact same thing that we just talked about. I'm going to have that larger number is going to make the deflection less. The smaller number would uh, if I did it as a board, you can make the deflection more, right? 
so this is one example of how you know this. Don't fret about it. Look for the information and translate it back into your terminology. Nobody else is going to do that for you, weirdly. Engineers don't even understand that it's weird terminology. Uh, so you have to actually make that happen. When you read these, these guidebooks, when you look at this information, you have to translate it back into your information, the way that you think about it. Oh, and don't forget SOHCAHTOA, sine, cosine, tangent. Tip six, we're going to go through a little faster on some of these. Um, key one of this is, uh, on this exam, really nobody cares if you're a brilliant designer. I know that's sort of shocking and hard to believe, and you know, you've been building up your whole life to prove to everybody that you're the best designer around. Uh, nobody cares. The only person that's going to read this, look at it, is a computer. Computer doesn't care. It doesn't, doesn't get a tear in its eye when you have a beautiful sequence or hierarchy shown or something like that. Um, it's about com uh, competence. Uh, it's about the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Uh, so that means that beauty and all that does not come into it. Um, and in fact, if it starts to come into it, if you s find yourself doing one of the vignettes, you're doing the schematic design vignette, and the word beauty or hierarchy comes into your mind, you should just turn the computer off and walk out because you've just failed it. Like you're not going to pass that exam if you're thinking that way. Uh, what you have to be thinking about is it's a puzzle. The vignettes are puzzles. They have architectural content, but they are not architecture, right? So there's going to be a bunch of information. I'm using it as an example of schematic design here. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of information that's going to come at you. You have to find a way to translate that information into something useful. So uh, the, my example that I'm showing here is, you know, you make a little matrix. Find a way to jot down on your scratch paper what the key pieces of information are. It's as important to practice how you're going to translate the information as it is to practice using the program. Uh, it's really important to know how you're going to move through that information. It's at least as important as understanding how to uh, how to actually draw in that particular program. So it's a puzzle. Think of it as a puzzle and then move through. That's kind of the key of any of the vignettes. Um, when you're thinking about uh, the, uh, the schematic design vignette, you actually know what it's going to be. It's going to be a two-story building. Uh, it's going to have a double height space in it. Um, that double height space is going to be the truck bay for the fire trucks, or it's going to be the gymnasium for the junior high, or it's going to be the reading room for the library, whatever, right? It's going to be a small institutional building, two stories. You have to deal with the stairs. You have to make sure the stairs line up. Nothing else really needs to line up. The upper floor doesn't even have to be the same size as the lower floor. Uh, that's not what it's about. It's a planning exercise. It's not about architecture. So it is not architecture. It is a puzzle about architecture. Um, it will look something very much like this. Don't try to make it anything else from that. If you find yourself, uh, so here's an example where uh, you've got, uh, here's a lobby, and here's a stair, and another stair, and I have this nice straight uh, corridor. I'm going to put the big room wherever, because for whatever program reason they want it there. Oh, maybe that's not a good one. Okay, maybe I'm going to do it with a stair there, and a stair there, and a nice little L shape with the lobby. That's great. It looks all great. I got another couple. If I find myself doing something like this, just throw it away, start again, right? Simplicity, make it simple. Don't, uh, it's not simple from the standpoint of be a modernist or anything like that. That's not what I mean. What I mean is if it's simple to look at, it'll be simple for you to find the mistakes. It'll be simple to make sure everything works. It'll be simple to make sure you're, you're not missing anything. Keep it competent and simple and straightforward. So the schematic design has the big the building design and the interior layout. Um, most people actually have trouble with the interior layout, the little tiny one, not the schematic design one. Because you actually have a fair amount of time for the schematic design one. The interior layout, you have a very limited period of time, uh, and it's, it seems like it should be so easy. You have to put a couple offices in, put some furniture in. I, we've all done that a million times, right? Like, how hard could that be? Uh, but actually, you have to do it really fast, and it's pretty tricky. Uh, and you have to make sure that you're working with the correct uh, accessibility. So I have in order for somebody in a wheelchair to be able to open a door. I have pull side and push side distances right uh, on the next to the latch. I've got the 60 inch uh, circle. Um, all of that stuff becomes uh, hugely important to make sure you've got to get it all the work and all of those things. Um, you definitely want to spend some time practicing your speed uh, on that one. All right, tip number seven. 
Do the little little one. Uh, plane sawing versus quarter sawing. Uh, so what's up with that? Plane sawing is about economy. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a piece of wood. Uh, if I'm a lumber yard owner, uh, I have this big uh, log. I'm going to cut a bunch of lines straight across all of it. Right? If I'm doing a quarter saw, I'm going to take that log and I'm going to saw it into quarters. And then I'm going to cut out like that. So what's going on there? What's going on there is uh, the quarter sawn is way less efficient. Plane sawn, way more efficient. But with the quarter sawn, if I look at the, uh, oops, that was not good. Uh, try this one a little better. I'm going to have nice straight grain lines, right? Because all those grains are going right through. The rings are going right straight through. If I look at it in section, right, it's going to look like that. It's going to expand and contract in all kinds of incredibly predictable ways. Uh, it's going to be very useful, very strong. It's going to wear well. The plane saw is going to be way more efficient from getting as much wood out of it as possible. But the grains are going to look like little cathedrals. right? Uh, if I look in section, it's going to be a lot of this kind of stuff. right? It's going to be much harder to understand exactly how it's going to expand and contract. Look for these kinds of things. This is just one example. Look for those kinds of things. That's something they can ask a question about. Right? It's an easy question, and it's easy to understand what it should be. OK, this is going to be the world's fastest description of uh, HVAC. Heating is easy. How do you do it? You light a fire. You burn something. It gets hot. Very simple. Cooling is hard. How do you make cooling work? What do you think? Anybody know? I move heat around. That's how I make cooling work. So how do I, make, uh, how do I move heat around? Here's a basic thing that will show up in 80% of the uh, HVA systems uh, in the United States. Uh, so I'm going to rip through this very fast. I apologize. Uh, I have a loop of refrigerant. That loop of refrigerant, refrigerant just happens to be a material that we like because it's got really useful uh, uh, properties to it. There's this uh, concept known uh, where if I pressurize some Thing, any particular material, if I pressurize a particular material, I can know what the temperature will be of that material. Very useful idea. I take that uh, refrigerant material, I compress it way, way down. So I'm up here, I'm compressing it down and I'm making it very, very uh, high pressure. That means this part is very hot. And then I get it to here and I let it expand out. And so that means this part, because it's now a different uh, pressure, is very cool. It's the same material, just going through this loop. I pressurize it, and then I let it expand out. I pressurize it, I let it expand out. It just keeps going through that loop. And because I'm doing that, it changes temperatures on the two sides. Why is that useful? Well, if you think about it over here, if I have the cool side inside the room, and I have the hot side outside, the cool side inside the room is going to accept warmth from the room. And then I'm going to move it to the outside, but before it gets outside, I'm changing the pressure of it, and I'm increasing the temperature of it. It's now hotter than the air temperature outside. It's going to give off the heat to the outside. So this one little concept is how I'm going to accept heat from the inside, and I'm going to give it off to the outside. That's how your room air conditioner window model works. That's how every air conditioner works. So how does that work? I have a four loop system. I have the, uh, that refrigerant loop. I have the pressurization. I have the expander. Uh, when I get the hot stuff, I have a loop out here that's going to take all that heat and get it off probably up to the roof and get rid of it. I have maybe a cold water loop here uh, that's going to take the cooling that we just made. Even though I said you can't make cooling. It's going to take the cooling we just made and bring it to wherever I need it. And then it's going to transfer that cooling to probably an air-based system that's then going to take it to where the people are. Do I always have all four loops? No. I could have one loop. I can have uh, three loops. I could have two loops. I can have four loops. But that concept is how e essentially every uh, air conditioning unit uh, in, uh, in the country is going to work. Right? So this really crazy, complicated-looking thing, right? there's my refrigerant loop. 
There's where I'm up on the roof I'm getting rid of the heat. This is my cold water going up and exchanging with the air. And this is where the air is uh, coming out and making me nice and cool in that building. That's the four loops right there. So you can see very complicated looking diagrams are actually quite simple. Tip nine. Uh, tip nine, 300 square feet to 350 square feet for a parking space. Uh, this is sort of for PPP and that kind of thing. Uh, so if you have to find a way to do, let's say somebody says you have uh, 100 cars. Well, how big of a parking lot is 100 cars? Multiply it by 300, there you go. How big is that parking lot? Uh, we always know that the parking lot is going to be somewhere between 60 and 64 feet wide. That's going to be enough room for a parking space, a drive aisle, and a parking space. And then what's the other dimension? It's going to be half the number of parking spaces times nine. Why? Because nine foot is the typical width of a parking space. So in like seconds, somebody can give you a fairly complicated sounding question, and you can figure out exactly how big that thing needs to be. Last thing, I'm not going to go through this really. I just want to say one kind of word. There's a whole uh, exam about programming. Um, first of all, who does the program? You do the program, right? You're the architect, right? So you make the program. Do you write the program? If I'm asking the question, that probably means no, right? Technically, you don't. The contracts say that's what the owners bring to the, to the deal. They have to know what they want. How do we know what they want? How do we have the ability to start designing for them? They give us the program, right? But often, clients don't have enough information. They don't know how to. They're not savvy enough in that process to know how to do that. So they will hire you for an additional service. It's an additional service onto the contract. If it's not written in, you don't get paid for it, right? So it's an additional service, and then you do uh, the program. What is the key thing about uh, an architectural program? Which sort of listed out there what's going on. The key thing about an architectural program is that you're not designing while you're doing the program. This is really hard for architects to understand. Uh, because we want to design from the get-go. But the entire point of doing a program is that you're looking at the data. You're understanding the information. You're looking at the context. You're building the case that you will then use to design. If you start designing right away, you are already uh, you're, you're compromising the information. If you start designing right away, you are now looking for data that supports your design, whether you mean to or not. It's exactly what you're not supposed to do. A program is supposed to be devoid of the design process. I can, can't guarantee, but it's really likely there'll be a question like that somewhere in there, because that's one of those things they want you to really understand. All right, there we go. Blasting through it. Top 10 tips for passing the ARE. Well, the, the forum's gone through a number of interesting moments. Uh, one example, um, a number of years ago, people started posting actual questions that they had memorized. Uh, and a lot of people got into to big, big trouble uh, because there's a huge deal. Uh, obviously, if you're NCARB, you really don't want there to be like direct questions being quoted uh, on forum sites. Um, and so that became a real problem for them. And so there was a lot of legal issues back and forth. And then there were some other things. So it's been through a number of lives. But the, the new version has essentially the same sets of information. Yeah, the question is about the graphic vignettes. Are there any good uh, resources for that? Uh, Norman Dorff's books um, are uh, a really great set. He was kind of the vignette guy for a very long time. And he did a bunch of these really kind of lovely little kind of self-produced uh, books. But uh, by far, the absolute best thing to do for the uh, uh, vignettes is actually download the program and do it on your computer. Definitely use the demos, test it out. Getting used to the program is a huge, huge deal. So it's good to look at the at the uh, resource books. Um, the Dorf stuff is probably the best that's out there. Although uh, all the guidebooks will have something, some version of it. Uh, but by far the best thing is just to get on and get used to it because it's a very unusual program. The graphic standards is actually uh, so. The question was uh, of the resources that I talked about. A number of them I was saying were sort of uh, specific for specific uh, tests. Graphic standards you'll find the most uh, applicable in the 4.0 uh, is going to be in the building design and construction systems um, exam, because that's where you see a lot of the kind of details. So things like uh, you know where are the weep holes, where are the uh, ties and masonry, where are the uh, you know 
how often are the studs, you know, uh, uh, all those kinds of things show up very easily uh, when you're sort of flipping through the graphics and then reading the, the text of the graphic standards. But there's also a lot of information in there about uh, planning elements. So for site planning, it can be very useful for, uh, you know, there's a number of different things. It's actually a pretty useful sort of general uh, document. Now, it's only so useful, don't spend a giant amount of time on it. It's just sort of a kind of a good one when you're, uh, when you're thinking about something, you see a question about something, you're like, well, I don't really understand what they're talking about. Can they, one of the first stops you can get to on, if it's those kinds of topics is the graphic standards, just to get a little bit more information. And then you just go on, you're Googling, you're doing whatever, you're finding the other. But like, it's a good place to sort of give you a backbone so you, because you start just opening it up to the internet, there's a lot of information out there and it's hard to distill out what's actually useful. Um, so the graphic standards is very specific to architectural practice. So this is a question that, that I get all the time and the, the answer is it doesn't really matter, just take them. Um, but I, I would say um, there, I do have a couple of theories about it. Um, I just mentioned one of them if you're trying to do the gaming the thing with the 4.0 and the 5.0 and so you can only do five exams like that. I think that's a pretty cool idea. Um, but what I would actually suggest um, is I would do the one that you think is going to be the easiest one for you first. So if you think you're going to be really good at uh, uh, the vignettes or something, do the schematic design, or you think you're really going to understand all the contracts because you've spent time dealing with contracts and stuff, do the CDNS. Do the one that you think is going to be the easiest for you to give you an easy way in so that you're not worried about the content uh, when, on your first try taking it. And then what I would do, the second one, is I would take the one that you think is going to be the hardest one. And why would I do that? Because uh, if it's the one that you're most likely to fail, you might as well do it right away, learn what you can out of that process. If you fail it, well, okay, you've got plenty of time to do the other ones in between, and then you can retake it, right? So that's how I would approach it, is just there's, there's no particular advantage of one to the next. The only other thing that I would say about that is, there's a number of overlaps between the different exams, and so you might want to think about taking uh, like uh, programming, planning, and practice, and site planning uh, at roughly the same time, uh, because there's a lot of information that overlaps between the two of them. So there's no advantage of separating them out by a long time, right? But other than that, it's whatever you feel comfortable with. Get that first, and then go to the hard ones. Yeah, there's there's a lot of material, um, and we'll talk more about them in other webinars, but. Um, uh, there's a, there's a couple of, uh, on the Black Spectacles resources page that was uh, starting off this, there's a resource line that has uh, a couple of books um, that are, I think are quite useful. Uh, the, um, I'm going to blank on the name, it's called Sun, Wind, and, Sun, Wind, and Light. Um, that's one of my favorites. Um, it's incredibly useful from sort of understanding uh, wind and convection and orientation. It's really graphic and straightforward and uh, has a ton of information that's very, very useful. Uh, I, it's, it's not like reading a big, heavy book. It's actually all about graphics. I highly recommend that one. I just think it's easy to, to grasp. Um, and then uh, the other ones, you'll find bits of information in really all of the other ones. Uh, there's site planning issues in MEB, in the MEEB book, in uh, graphic standards, uh, in the professional practice. All of them have different aspects to it. The, the planning things are surprisingly complicated because it seems like, well, how hard could planning be? Um, but actually, it, it encompasses issues about soils and it encompasses issues about uh, uh, airflow and uh, the fact that wind is stronger or higher than it is down lower and uh, that there's a difference between uh, facing to the south in the northern hemisphere than there is facing to the north. Like, it's all of those kinds of things, plus all the sustainability issues about uh, cut and fill and uh, where are you going to put, if you're going to dig a big hole on the site, where are you going to put all that material? It's going to cost a lot of money and it's going to take a lot of embodied energy to move that out. What about how things, uh, uh, dealing with toxic issues, like if you find that you do an environmental report and there's a, a toxic stuff, right? So there's lots and lots of different issues. You're not going to find really one book, except for maybe some of the guidebooks, but you're not going to find one book that really captures all of that. You're going to have to sort of figure out what the issues are, and then look for specific sets of information. The big thing about uh, it's it's great to uh, help other people and to share information and have conversations about the exam. Just don't share specific wording of questions or specific in piece of information that uh, obviously would be a version of cheating. Um, like that is 
a serious, serious problem for NCARB. Uh, it costs everybody a lot of money, and it's quite plausible that you could get blackballed uh, very simply and easily, uh, and you would never be able to take the exam uh, and never be, get licensed. Uh, so it's take it very, very seriously. Having said that, it, you know we're all a community, help each other, do what you got to do, but just not specifically. Um, like it, it's it's all part of uh, sort of finding that sort of reasonable line. Uh, okay, so we should probably end it off there. And the the key thing I want to make sure that you uh, you picked up was tip number one: don't panic. It's all good. You're gonna get through it. You know, a lot of people are going through the same thing. Get with them. Have it, make it a party. You'll be a better architect at the end of it. All right. Well, thank you, Mike, and thanks to all of you who've tuned in. If you'd like to attend our next ARE Live broadcast, visit blackspectacles.com/podcast to register to attend. You'll have a chance to ask questions and share your answers with Mike for live feedback during the broadcast. Uh, and to learn more about our AIA ARE prep curriculum, go to blackspectacles.com. Uh, we'll also put a link in the show notes. And for those of you who want to get busy preparing for the ARE, you can use a 15% coupon off the first charge of any AIA ARE prep membership with code 52715webinar, which will expire on June 15th. And of course, if you're already an AIA member, you can visit aia.org slash ARE prep to get a 30% discount for the entire duration of your Black Spectacles membership, not just the first charge. Uh, and this also expires on June 15th. Finally, uh, please leave a comment below the video to let us know what you think and share any suggestions you may have. I promise we'll read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching. Thank you.